Hello everyone! Today we're going to take a look at the 1995 adaptation of Persuasion by Jane Austen. You may see it referred to as Jane Austen's Persuasion, or as an episode of Screen 2. There are two separate listings for this movie on IMDb, and for some reason, the one for the TV episode is much more accurate um, as far as the cast and crew list goes, but that one is a little harder to find. If you just search Persuasion, it's not one of the first things that comes up. I've got an eyelash that just went in my eye. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, I've put a link to that listing in the description. Directed by Roger Mitchell and adapted by Nick Deere, Persuasion stars Amanda Root as Anne Elliot, a woman who was convinced to end her relationship with sailor Frederick Wentworth, played by Kieran Hines. When, after eight years of disappointment and regret, a change in circumstances leads to an awkward reunion, Anne struggles to conceal her feelings while everyone raves about the now distinguished Captain Wentworth, an eligible bachelor who seems completely indifferent to her. But is all that was between them once truly gone forever? I talked about the book before, briefly, the last time I read it. That was probably five or six years ago, and I'm kind of appalled that it's taken me this long to get around to discussing this movie. Austin fans are prone to debate which of her six completed novels is the best, and Persuasion, a novel she wrote when she was older that was published after her death, is one of the strongest contenders. It differs from her earlier work with regard to characters, tone, and depth of feeling. There's a pervasive maturity and dignity in persuasion, and I think the 1995 adaptation reflects that. The film's not particularly flashy or artsy. There's nothing daring about the editing or photography. Sets and costumes are pleasing but straightforward. Jeremy Sam's piano score is calm and contemplative. It does have Austin's signature humorous moments, but they're more understated. There are no bold additions or revisions visions in the narrative, it abides by the text without making controversial attempts to read between the lines, and it doesn't insert anything risque in an effort to appeal to mainstream viewers who might otherwise be bored. In other words, it's a good old-fashioned, dependable adaptation. It's not the only version of Persuasion out there. What I've seen of the 1971 miniseries isn't bad. I've watched the 2007 adaptation several times, and while it's definitely more stylized and takes a few liberties, it has its merits. There's also the one from 2022, which exists. For my money, this one is the best adaptation, and I believe credit for that largely goes to Amanda Root's portrayal of Anne Elliot. Now, Persuasion is a story that's just full of unlikable creatures. That's not unusual. Austin came up with a lot of despicable characters, but these are some of her most distasteful. Not her most villainous, but just people that you feel like, ugh. <laughs> Does the supporting cast run away with some of Austin's descriptions? Do they go overboard in some cases? Maybe. Um, they might be more like caricatures than real people, but that's part of the fun. Anne's father, Sir Walter, played by Corin Redgrave, is a flamboyant, arrogant man who fixates on age and physical beauty. He's obsessed with rank and has nothing but disdain for anyone who works for a living. He has zero concept of household economy and thinks his station entitles him to live above his means, which drives his family into debt so deep they're forced to rent their house to people he considers beneath his notice. His other daughters, Elizabeth and Mary, take after him. Elizabeth, played by Phoebe Nichols, is self-indulgent and peevish. Honestly, she seems kind of nuts. <laughs> she has a short fuse where Anne is concerned, and vastly prefers the company of the obsequious widow Mrs. Clay, a toadying nobody, to that of her own sister. Mary, played by Sophie Thompson, is the married one and a chronic complainer who makes a big deal out of being sick to get sympathy. She's always griping about the lack of attention and deference she receives from her in-laws, but when Anne does anything for her, she expresses no gratitude. She doesn't bother to get up and greet her when she arrives for a visit and lets Anne do housework and look after the kids in her place. 
For all the importance they put on rank and good breeding, they're all excessively rude. They say the most outrageous things, ranging from illogical to just plain cruel, and they never even think about apologizing. It checks out. <laughs> Surrounding your main character with a menagerie of selfish, arrogant swine is bound to make her look like a saint, but I would argue that even without these people to compare her to, Anne Elliot would still be an admirable protagonist and a great role model. We're introduced to her when she enters a room where the family is discussing their financial situation. Since Anne is actually the one who does most of the work running the household, this is a conversation she should have been included in from the very beginning, but it seems uh, they didn't bother to wait for her arrival. And when she does come in, she apologetically takes a chair in the back along the wall instead of joining the rest of the family in the center of the room. You would think she was a visitor, not the daughter and sister. I noticed that Sir Walter interacts a lot with Elizabeth and Mrs. Clay, but he rarely looks at Anne, and talking to her seems kind of like an effort to him. Both her sisters presume on her generous, helpful nature and think nothing of pushing her around and foisting their own duties onto her shoulders. Um, I guess you could say, well, it's a compliment that they know they can ask her to do something and she'll get it done, but that's not fair. <laughs> She's almost treated like a servant, um, except I think if she were the housekeeper, she would at least get the respect due her position as head of the household staff. Here, she's treated like a drudge. What Anne's family fails to recognize is that she is wise and capable. The servants respect her, and her willingness to work alongside them doesn't degrade her in their eyes. It's only her own family that is blind to her gifts. They don't know what to do with her, and her past recalcitrance and present refusal to be enamored with rank and social status as they are irritates them, which in turn makes her more likable in our eyes. Anne Elliot is not the same type of heroine as Elizabeth Bennet and Emma Woodhouse. It is a great mistake to try to make her fit that mold. From a Regency point of view, she's not a young lady, and she's not especially witty or energetic. Uh, she's not someone who laughs a lot, her conversation isn't sprinkled with clever quips, and she's not turning any heads. I believe the older you get, the more you appreciate the contrast, and the more refreshing it is to see this kind of heroine, um, and to see this kind of heroine be uh, the protagonist in a love story. Um, not everyone is a Lizzie Bennet, and the world needs more Eleanor Dashwoods and Fanny Prices and Anne Elliots. No effort is made to glamorize her. On the contrary, they may have made Amanda Root even more haggard and bedraggled than Austin herself envisioned. Yet she is good-natured, despite her circumstances. She's always thoughtful, and she's a sympathetic person and a respectful listener, no matter who she's talking to or how absurd they are. She takes great pains to conceal what she's going through, and that's where the intensity of this story lies. Both Anne Elliot and Frederick Wentworth exercise tremendous restraint to hide what they're feeling, but it's there. Take the range of emotions Anne goes through in the minute when she thinks that Frederick has gotten married, or the way her hand grips the chair for dear life when she first sees him again. To have a romance you can really sink your teeth into, both parties need to be well-matched, and both of these actors bring their A-game. Kieran Hines is very likable as Captain Wentworth. He has the imposing but approachable figure of the accomplished sailor, and he nails the meaningful glances. He plays the good-humored, confident storyteller who takes the fawning attention of the young ladies in stride, but maybe he's laying it on a bit thick because all the while he's acutely aware of Anne's presence. He tries not to make eye contact with her, but it's increasingly apparent he notices her when others don't, and looking at his face, we detect his agony, trying to pretend his heart wasn't broken and he's not still carrying a torch, too proud to show he's been hurt, but too honest to hide that he cares. Persuasion is quietly romantic. It's not a story with huge demonstrations and heroic deeds. It's more about 
subtle giveaways, furtive glances, and conscientious, considerate gestures, like Wentworth seeing that she's tired and insisting the Crofts take her in their carriage, the way he trusts her cool-headedness in an emergency and insists that she's more capable than anyone else in their party. And speaking of regret to Captain Bennick while Wentworth looks on, Wentworth talking about the depths of devotion a man can feel for a woman. We never see how it was between them before, eight years ago, but we can get an idea. Their conversation in the shop, once it starts rolling, is pleasant and easy. They could really get somewhere if it weren't for the constant interruptions. Over the course of the story, Anne herself undergoes a little change. Physically speaking, she perks up, but personality-wise, she blooms and comes into her own. Fed up with so much meddling and presumption and arrogance, she finally, with dignified respect, starts standing up for herself and her convictions. She even gets a little sassy at the end, stymieing Mr. Elliot by feigning ignorance. As for the novel's pivotal scene, well, what I consider the pivotal scene, the adaptation does a fine job with Anne and Captain Harville's discussion of inconstancy and fidelity in men versus women. I think any stickler would be pleased with the way this conversation is done, and the scene does justice to everyone's favorite epistolary declaration of love. I... I do wish, perhaps, that they hadn't gone with the overlapping voiceover, his voice crossfading with hers and back again as she reads what he wrote. That's one of the best letters in literature, and I don't want to miss a word, but I'm quibbling. I do think it's funny that neither this one nor the 2007 version manages to quite stick the climactic landing. When the 2007 version came out, we all made fun of Anne doing a marathon through the streets of Bath and crashing into Wentworth. But is that much stranger than this take on the reunion scene, with the noisy backdrop of a traveling circus parade? Mm, yeah, nothing gets me in the mood for romance, like men walking around on stilts and breathing fire. <laughs> it is a pretty weird, distracting setting for the kiss we've all been waiting for, and I've always wondered why they chose to do it that way. It's not mentioned at all in the book, but it does emphasize how oblivious our happy couple is to anyone but each other. Fortunately, both versions make up for any strangeness with cute epilogues. This one takes us on board Wentworth's ship, showing that Anne has followed in Mrs. Croft's footsteps and joined her husband on his sea voyage. It's not the most exhilarating ending, but it's nice, and the picture of quiet contentment suits the couple. Admiral and Mrs. Croft, by the way, are one of the highlights of this adaptation. They come onto the scene like a breath of fresh air. Finally, good, likable people and a happily married couple. There aren't a lot of those here. Their coming could have been a source of bitterness to Anne. Mrs. Croft is Frederick's sister, and their relationship is a painful reminder of what might have been. But Anne doesn't respond to it that way. She takes to them immediately, and they become friends, and she's overjoyed to be reunited with them in Bath. They then become a picture of her future, a couple who traverse the world by sea, growing old together and content in any situation so long as they're together. For another good example of humble happiness, we have the Harville House at Lyme. It's a stark contrast to the spacious but cold rooms at Kellynch Hall or the stylish Bath townhouse, and Mary's mortified at its messiness, but it's a home full of love and laughter and good company, better than any fancy estate. Another highlight for me is one of the more humorous scenes, a montage where each member of the Musgrove family secretly pulls Anne aside to have a talk with her, confiding in her their complaints about her sister, and asking if she could just tell Mary this, just get Mary to stop that. I love how this scene is acted and edited. I also have to chuckle when Anne is deep in conversation with moody, bereft Captain Bennick, and upon realizing that he's steeped himself in poetry as a way of mourning the loss of his fiancée, she tells him, Perhaps you should read more prose. <laughs> it strikes me as a very Austin-esque warning. And I appreciate that each character, even the ones who appear just once or twice, is memorable in his or her own particular way. 
Anne's enthusiastic friend Mrs. Smith, and her eccentric gossip-ferrying nurse, Mr. Elliot, Anne's father's heir, who she finds charming but sketchy, that's my word, not hers, Lady Russell, who seems harmless enough at the start, but the more you know of her, the less you like her. And my goodness, I can't leave out Lady Dalrymple. She is a Viscountess! <laughs> I do get a kick out of the way the film chooses to portray her. Uh, the Elliots make such a big deal out of this person, and then we see her, and she's nothing special at all. In fact, she's kind of tacky, but so, I would argue, is Sir Walter. Birds of a feather, I guess. Editing Weaselberry here, I'd like to point out a few additional details I've noticed while preparing this video. I know at the beginning I emphasized that this isn't a flashy or daring adaptation, which in my opinion is a good thing, but that doesn't mean it's devoid of creativity or lacking in artistic or technical elements. Take the fact that most of the homes we see have a crowded, lived-in look. Domiciles reflect both the socioeconomic status and personality of their occupants, which makes them feel remarkably authentic. Night scenes may appear a bit dark, but that's because the rooms have a genuine candlelit glow. Notice there are candles placed everywhere, and the flames are huge. I can't believe they really shot these scenes with nothing but candlelight. That would be very difficult. Assuming they didn't, they did a great job with the illusion. Also, there is a prodigious amount of eating in this movie. Cookies, cake, bonbons, iced fruit, ham, all sorts of things for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. And most of the actors dig into all of it with gusto. So much eating occurs on camera, and it is so noticeable that it must have been intentional. There are also subtle visual contrasts, like how we first see Admiral Croft managing his ship and his men, and then we see Sir Walter, who has mismanaged his house and his creditors, or there's the contrast in the pomp and ceremony with which Sir Walter and Elizabeth and Mrs. Clay leave Kellynch Hall in their fancy coach, compared to the way Anne departs, seated next to the driver in a rickety open cart in front of a pig, all the way to Uppercross. It's little things like these that you might not notice on your first or second viewing, but they help magnify the authenticity and character of the entire production. One last thing before I go, and my fellow Jane Eyre fans will find this interesting. I'm very familiar with this adaptation of Persuasion, I've seen it many times, but it had been quite a few years since the last time, and while I was aware that the leads had been in adaptations of Jane Eyre, I didn't realize that there were actually seven Jane Eyre connections here. Judy Cornwell, who plays Mrs. Musgrove, was Mrs. Reed in the 1983 adaptation. Fiona Shaw, who plays Mrs. Croft, was Mrs. Reed in the 1996 adaptation. Sophie Thompson, who plays Mary Musgrove, nay Elliot, played Jane Eyre in the 1994 radio adaptation opposite Kieran Hines. Richard McCabe, who plays Captain Benwick, played Mr. Brocklehurst in the 2006 adaptation. Samuel West, who plays Mr. Elliot, was St. John Rivers in the 1996 adaptation. Amanda Root, who plays Anne Elliot, was Miss Temple in the 1996 adaptation, and Kieran Hines, Captain Wentworth, was Mr. Rochester in the 1997 adaptation. Probably the more you like his Wentworth, the less you like his Rochester, who is brash and abrasive and um, so very different from his Wentworth. The characters um, couldn't be more dissimilar to begin with, but the script and direction did Hines no favors with that adaptation of Jane Eyre. If only he'd been able to play the role on screen the way he had in the 94 radio show, I think things would have been very different. Persuasion is a very fine film and about as good an adaptation as you can get. I think I'd say the book is the best version of the story, but I would recommend this adaptation over any other. It's a lovely story, with entertaining characters you either love to love or love to hate, and a romance that gives hope to those with broken hearts and those who may fear the chance for a happy ever after has passed them by.
I hope you enjoyed this review. If you have seen this version of Persuasion, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So go ahead and share what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.